If you want to put down all your glasses and cups and promise not to boo, I'll admit I'm a venture capitalist. So we're one of these horrible people that, that get in the way of things. Part of what you're going to do if you want to build up a biopharmaceutical or a biotechnology company is a bit like being in the Lord of the Rings. It's a quest. Before you get to the goal, you're going to have to go through a lot of really deep, dark, horrible places and see some really horrible and strange people, including myself. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to give you a guide through these deep, dark places. I'm going to come from the stage where you've already got your company up there, you've got part of your funding. Uh, you want to then try and create some sort of sustainable, viable business. That means having to do a business plan that will take you through understanding the clinical development costs and development paths and where you'll get your funding from to get you to that critical mass. It's very, very important that I see that you know how to do it. I'm pressing the right button now. Okay. So it doesn't seem to be going further than this. I might turn it on. Nope, turn it off. Okay. So why listen to me? 25 years in the sector. I've done 15 private equity investments all across Europe. Some of these names are very successful. Uh, some of them have been less successful. But out of this list, Crucell went public, recently sold for well over a billion. Wirex, public company. Omrix, public company, acquired by Johnson & Johnson. Novitas, Movetus, public company, acquired by Shire. Cyclocell, I think you know it's out there. Plethora, Futura Medical, Prostracum, has also been acquired. All public companies. Tan Tanox, very successful asthma product, acquired by Genentech and Novartis. So, a reasonable track record. I do know what I'm doing. I'm except doing this, obviously. <laughs> it does, okay. doesn't seem to want to go where I want it to go to. Okay, there we go. But I've also managed a quoted investment fund, uh, 100 million. We're one of the few crossover funds, which means I look at private equity and public companies. I know the, what, from experience what these companies have to do, what they have to see, how to get there. It's not all just about grants. It's not all, all, all about setups and startups and costs. At some point in time, the risks going to have to be there, and you have to face the risks. And there's a clear valuation gap between private companies and public companies. You know, I see now private companies coming to me that say, we have raised 40 million, and we think we're worth 80 million, or 60 million, and we'll go public 100 million. And I say, well, I've got three companies in my quoted portfolio just now, all four years further developed than you, all have industrial partners, all have valuations less than your capital. Tell me how I'm getting my money back. No one knows. What's a successful investment strategy? You start off with this, and you end up with one of these. That's everyone's goal. Uh, so far, I think most people are still, you've got the wheels in the car and not much further forward. That's my track line. Very, very simple. Forget all the big things about it. As a venture capitalist, always get more out than you put in. Simple as that. Which means the companies I work with I have to see that they have got the, the potential, the three things they need. Science that's commercial, not blue sky sexy science, but commercial science. The management team has to be good and has to have a business strategy that maximizes the value of their assets. You know, these things have got to be in place. Now, and if I see that, I'm happy. If it's not there, I have to supply one of these things that's missing. I don't like supplying all of them, though. Funding sources. Well, we've been through this. Most of the talks we've had here uh, have covered the very early stage. This is, as I say, been well covered today. I'm coming from a totally different direction. Universities, there's grants, tech transfer funds, government money. Early stage, there's grants. Self-funding, if you're an academic and you've got the money or it's your second company. Seed funding, that should be not deed funding. So you get seed funding, angel syndicates. However, that's a finite pool. 
and it can only take you almost to the stage of not even proof of concept sometimes. Then you get to the development stage. If you've got deep pocketed angels, they can still be there. Or you have to come to the venture funds, or if you're in the med tech sector or diagnostics, perhaps you can use loan or debt strategies. Then at the late stage, even deeper pocketed venture funds, you go to the public market, you partner with pharma companies, or you're able to use loans or debt. Loans or debt are something I'll mention briefly uh, as being good and bad. If you look where the money's coming from over the last few years, you can basically see that venture has hardly moved. And you think that's where it, all the interest is. You know, what's really ri risen is other. And that is effectively debt and various other instruments. Uh, convertible loan notes, selling off part of your royalty stream, etc. The equity has not been that strong. The EU funding has stalled in general. It's not just a Scottish problem. Uh, basically, the, you can see that there's been very little difference in both the average amount of money put in and the average amount of money that's out there. Part of that's a function of uh, the microclimate and part of it's a function of VCs preserving more and more capital for follow-ons. And I'll explain why they're doing that quite soon. However, Europe is catching up with the US. Now, the US has got a lot more cash. Each investment fund there is about three to five times bigger than the average investment fund in Europe. And there's three to five times more of them. But in general, in terms of average and VC amounts for rounds, Europe is catching up. Uh, but a lot of people still regard America as a promised land. Bring a US investor on board and their deep pockets will f solve all your problems. This however is into that, of course. While VC funding's up 30% and IPO funding's up 60% in 2009, that's basically up from a hole in the ground. It's not that great. However, 45% of that VC funding that's recently come out has involved a corporate venture arm. Now, the jury's still out as to how independent that is in terms of are they acquire, investing in you to run your business or are they already accessing part of your lead asset or whatever and does it mean they'll pull that money out from the other side when they actually try and do a licensing deal? Of all the 12 IPOs in 2010, they were all late stage companies in Europe, a lot of them Benelux, where I'm from. However, none in the UK. The UK is not a pretty picture. And the average company age before it went public is growing. Currently, it's at nine years. I expect I've hit double figures. So if you're setting up a company, consider that before you even get it to the point where you might get money back out into your own pocket, it might be 10 years worth of work. Where the US goes, Europe tends to follow. If you look at you, there you're fundraising in the US, VC, this is funds raised by VCs, it's going down. So basically, the pool that you're going to try and take your company in now, if you're a small company, is getting smaller going forward. Everyone hopes the public markets will turn around, everyone hopes there'll be lots of successes, and money will pour back into the sector. Currently, that's not happening. There's just less and less money out there, which means that people are becoming more and more selective, which means you, as the people with the companies, are going to have to come much, much better at what you do. That's not to say you're not doing it well. It just means the landscape's changing. You have to be flexible and you have to be able to move with it. And for, and for those who can get it, the debt proportion is growing all the time. However, you will not get debt until you've got a significant asset that you can leverage. Your IP, whether it's a platform or it's an asset, unless you can leverage that asset, which means you've proven proof of concept, you want access debt on it. So that basically means that debt proportion there is out with small companies reach, which makes it a worry forward looking. So you should listen to a financial expert when you try to compare what's happening in Europe to the US. One financial expert said, this is not America, but I wouldn't trust anyone that dresses like that. However, don't look for US. If we're gonna solve this problem, it has to be solved in the, U in the UK and in Europe. US funds are reluctant to invest for several reasons. The round sizes are too small. You're trying to raise three to five million, their average bite size is seven to 10 million. They're not gonna take that risk exposure to your company. 
there's a close to home effect. This does not just happen in America. But they'll look and say, I can see five companies in Boston, three companies in San Diego, do something similar to you. Why should I fly to Scotland? They won't do it. This also happens, believe it or not, for funds in London. <laughs> they will not. The first thing they say to me if I present a Scottish company to them is, looks interesting, looks good. Where's the local champion? Who am I investing with? And you say, no one. They say, well, no, too far away. I'm not going to do it just now. The other thing is that for US funds, the exits are risky, unpredictable, unplannable. And don't forget, there's usually a minimum 10% currency risk for them, which means that you know, they could, if they make 20%, they could lose half of that just because the dollar and pound, the dollar and euro has changed. It may not be something you worry about, but if you try and get money from them, it's something they worry about. You have to create at least 10% more value than you expect before they'll even touch you. So that takes America out of the picture. But it's, a, but it's still the promised land because it's much larger funds. They usually have more tangible assets for debt. They do debt easier. They're, they attract Asian money. US funds attract Asian money. There's more liquidity. The valuations are usually three to five times higher. Uh, one example was Movetis, which we took public, was valued at uh, 450 million euros when it went public. Six months later, Ironside Pharmaceuticals in the US, with an almost identical drug at an earlier stage of development, went out with a valuation nearly 2 billion. Uh, that makes no logical sense, but you understand why you'd much rather be there than here. And also, there's a higher proportion of the generalist fund put money into risk. A lot of the US generalist funds will have a thing that says, we'll put 10% into risk, which means biotechnology, other risky sectors. Generalist funds in Europe, in the UK especially, 2%, 3% maximum. So even if it's a fund with the same money, they'll give you less. Now, there's limiting factors if you want to grow your company in Europe. There's less capital from a smaller VC market. Not just the capital, but there's not enough funds. Just now there's about four significant VC players in Europe. That gives them a near monopoly over deals. And they can pick and choose and cherry pick and form their own syndicates, uh, which makes it very, very difficult. So not only do we, need to create, do we need to have more money in Europe, but we also have to have more competition between the investors. Valuations, quite often five times smaller than the US. So it's a limiting factor for US companies. There's no public market for exit, I know this. And as I just said, your quoted peers are quite often illiquid and lower value in terms of their net asset value than you are. And the liquidity is very important. And there's a zero risk policy, as I say. Investors take a zero risk policy. Anyone in here that could stand up and say, biotechnology development, zero risk, I think you're in the wrong business. <laughs> the development success is fleeting. I mean, this is just an idea of, uh, and the farm people in here might disagree with the actual numbers, but it just shows you if you go through like phase success and look at the success probability, you, know, you end up with very low numbers in terms of getting a successful asset out, which means that if you're basically a single company with a preclinical asset and wanting funding, you have to realize just how little chance you have of getting success, and that has to be reflected in, in what you'll actually do. The deal structures are changing, uh, and pharma is de-risking from, from my experience, and again, I'm quite happy to see the uh, pharma companies disagree with me, but uh, the, while the deal structures are staying, maybe valuations in the whole deal, the, the famous bio-dollar deals things are changing, the dynamics has been turned around. You're getting less upfront, more backloading. If you're running your business, unfortunately, the upfront is what you need. You have to pay your salaries. You have to run next year and the year after. No, you don't want something five, six years down the line that promises to make you a multimillionaire if you go bankrupt in between. That's a traditional funding model, basically. If you look here, you can see that development phase one, phase two, phase three, the costs go shooting up over the timeline. And it's very straightforward. The model was private funding from whatever source, takes you up to about phase two. End of phase two, public or pharma takes over. You're either IPO or your ph a pharma partner steps in and licenses. 
this still can happen, and the pharma company can still license at this stage, but it's happening less and less. What's happening more now is you're getting a funding model like this. You still get the private funding up to phase two. End of phase two into phase three, where your costs explode. Pharma are not necessarily stepping in, and there's no public market. So that's a funding gap that can't be solved just now. Pharma companies will either pay very, very, very generously for an early stage asset that they basically can take control, bring in house, whether it's a platform technology or a target or a series of targets. Or they'll say, de-risk it for us. We'll pick it up midway through three, three. And again, to some extent, money no object. They'll pay a lot of money for that. Let's say the old model still happens occasionally, but this is happening more and more. So if you're going out with a company now, you have to be able to structure your development plan to say, how do I cover that gap or how do I cover that, that hole in the ground? Uh, and if you're a company and come to me and say, we've got that covered and we know exactly how we're going to do it, show me, because I've got no idea how to do it just now. So pharma is changing and the VC model's been slow to react. Pharma's a bit more risk averse, generous for, generous for assets when they want to get them. And the VCs are still designed for phase two. The funding gap is getting bigger, and good assets are actually getting lost at this point in time. And this is basically a quick look at uh, what I think people should look at now. Don't look at success rates, look at failure rates. And failure rates are much, much bigger. This is just made up from analysts uh, that look at across the sector. And it basically shows that there's a very high failure rate. Everyone thinks that their baby is the best in the world. The truth is that trials will basically show you that there's a very good chance that what you have will not work, full stop. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try them. How do you value these companies then? Universities, often negative value to be perfectly honest, or your value to the cost that the money has been put into it. It's very hard to put a value on technology just as it's put in the university. Early stage, again, we tend to value almost at the setup costs. You know, if you brought your company out and it's worth a million and you still haven't actually got to any sort of proof of concept, you're worth about the cash you put in for me. My risk is I'm giving you cash to create more value. The de development stage, we are quite often price you to risk. So if you go back to the previous thing, said failure rates, we will discount back a potential valuation quite aggressively because we will basically price to the risk involved in it. You could also do price to peers or sum of parts. Less accurate, there's no peers around. Uh, most of the time, your, your companies are very innovative, very unique. It's almost impossible to find a peer that I can happily say this one's an equal to. So, and sum of parts, quite, you don't usually single asset, you don't have enough to do a sum of parts calculation on you. And also there's a valuation risk due to the cash burn. If you're running out of cash, you're worth less. Simple as that. Of course, once you get to the promised land, you've been through the deep dark places in your late stage, then, you can, then we can calculate an enterprise value plus your cash into a DCF, net present value, peer group analysis. These are problematic since public to private valuations are not in sync just now. And there's also a lockup risk don't forget, if you go public, your investors will not be able to sell a single share in you for six months. So even if you go public up here, your valuation might be down here by the time they release. And you, as, as owners of the companies, you'll be locked up probably for 12 months, which means your value can be even further down here. So it's very difficult to just say you're worth what you are at IPO. All right, pipeline asset risk value. This is numbers that every single person that shows you shows you, we'll show them different. These are the ones I work with. Uh, as I say, this is more for biotech drug development. Classic small molecules are probably slightly different. Uh, if you're a medical device, this doesn't apply at all. But basically these numbers are indicators of what I, th I think you get. So this is your pipeline basically. That's your timeline. Standard pipeline picture that you see when companies show they've got a pipeline, asset one, asset two, stage of development. <coughs> You know, asset one is probably about 75% risk attached to it, but it's still 75% of the value of your company, which means that your whole value of your company is, is based on risk. 
and as you go down further down, less developed, the risk associated goes shoot, shooting through the roof, and the value that investors will ascribe to that basically disappears down to nothing at all. Uh, and at some point in time, on a very regular basis, you have to assess what you've got here. And if you suddenly see that asset three, in your opinion, has got an awful lot less risk, then basically that should switch to being asset one. You should put all your cash and activity into building that value. You know, just because this one's furthest developed does not mean it's the best. I find some companies very slow to learn that lesson. The project kill is a very hard thing to do, but you have to be ruthless. So, how do you get out of this problem? There's noble funding. The standard debt. If any of you tried to get a mortgage just now, it's very hard to get, and that's with bricks and mortar of a house that's already built. Uh, you go to them with an idea, and a biotech product's very early stage, you won't get it. You're cash burning with no credible, with no credible risk for them. Venture debt. You have to secure that by IP or capital assets. This happens a lot in the US because a lot of the companies own the facilities and their buildings and they can use this as, as securitizing against the debt. Most European companies are in bio quarters, in parks. They don't, they're, they're, tech, they're leases. They don't have assets that they can put forward to debt. The only thing they have is their IP. Always a risky strategy because if you do get the next round of funding, how much does it cost to get rid of that debt? Because the first thing you investors want is to have the IP back again. And if it's going to cost a lot to do it, you, you share, you'll scare investors away. Then, then you get to what the VCs are doing now. They become a lot more cautious. They say, okay, we'll give you 5 million or 10 million, but it's not going to pop into your bank, bank account next month. We'll, uh, we'll tranche it. We'll give you 2 million. And you hit a milestone, we'll give you the next point. And you hit the next milestone, we'll give you another point. While that is good for them, and it, it, it decreases their risk exposure, as a CEO of a small company, it makes your actual business strategy planning very difficult to do. You know, if you don't know, because you can't guarantee you'll pass a milestone. Simple as that. So how do you build four years when you know you have to go through two milestones? It makes it very difficult to do. Uh, and, it can, and if you do it through a convertible loan note, it can be very, very dilutive. If you hit the milestone, the loan translates one on one. So perfectly good, it's equity. If it doesn't hit the milestone, the loan tr transfers 8x, 10x. Suddenly, as owners of your own company, you're wiped out. Again, it's a risk. Do you want to do it? Royalty sales. You could try and sell the future value of the product. Almost impossible unless you've got a near to market product. And asset funding. This is a totally, fairly new idea. But there's, in the States especially, and it's, people are talking about it in Europe, is basically saying, well, why don't we go into a specialist investor who will basically fund one project or two projects? But what we have to do is spin that out as an SPV, which we will have, the company will have 50% ownership or maybe 60% ownership, depending on how you negotiate it. But the SPV will be funded by this new tranche of money. Uh, it might mean that at the end of the day, you, your original company ends up effectively as a holding company for three asset-driven SPVs. But if they're all being funded and they're all creating value, that may be a new or more innovative way to look at things. It's also potentially less dilutive for your existing shareholders. Existing shareholders, while they don't want to put more money in, don't like being diluted. You've got to conserve the burn, basically. That's the only way you're going to bridge these gaps. I think that one of the ways to do that is hothouse projects in the universities for an awful lot longer. This is good for the companies. It's effectively passing the buck to someone else. But I think it's important. Some things have been spun out just a bit too early. And I, you know, to use the, to use the uh, gynecology obstetrics thing, too many things have been born far too early, which means the risk of stillbirth is very, very high. Hot house it longer, incubate it longer. Outsource as much as possible. That's sometimes difficult to do because you basically come out of a university lab and you're used to doing it all yourself. Sending it out to someone else to do sometimes can be against your nature. Investigate if you can. It might be more cost efficient. Uh, and rationalize the management. Do you need as many? Uh, one of the things I've been discussing with 
uh, Bio Flanders, is basically a lot of startup companies only raise one to two million, and then they employ a CEO on 150,000 because he's experienced, and a business development officer at 100, 120,000. You know, it's a fifth to an eighth of your money disappearing out the window straight into someone's pocket. Now they're doing a job for you, but I've been in startup companies. You know, one of the ones I actually worked in. I think the CEO became, became an expert at playing solitaire on his computer because 70% of his time, there wasn't a lot for him to do. Uh, so maybe you could, I've already mentioned this to Scottish Enterprise and I've said speaking to BioFans about it, maybe there's a way of setting up some group where you can have one CEO managing three companies. So you have the chief technology officer or scientific officer doing the day-to-day -day running and then a CEO comes in to work on development and strategy with them. And you could do that for a business officer. That means that instead of spending 150,000, three companies spend 50,000 on an experienced person. Obviously, conflict of interest, etc., things you have to look out for, but it's potentially an interesting model to use. Also, these CEOs are easy to get rid of. Less options, less types of product, cheaper to get rid of. So take home messages. You've been through the dark and horrible place. Uh, Unfortunately, you're not out the other side, because I don't even know where that's going to happen. <laughs> Funding's difficult, but it's not impossible. You have to be realistic in the risk. A lot of early stage CEOs do not see risk. They only look at how incredibly beautiful their own baby is. There's risk attached to it. Uh, and just because you invented it doesn't mean it's good. Uh, that's unfortunately, if you look at the failure rates, it's been proven at. Of course, I can point to every single one of you and say each one of you probably does have something that's good, uh, but I'll be wrong 70% of the time. Make your valuation on the success, not the cost. Uh, so basically, look at what the chance of success of the thing is, rather than combining cost and potential, how much value you'll get five years down the line. Big Pharma is still, I think, very generous, but it prefers to take a lot bigger proportion of the risk, or none of the risk, than it has traditionally done in the last 20 years. Uh, the novel funding, I think, should be supported by institutions and government. That doesn't happen just now. So that's it. You've heard my horror story. Feel free to ask me lots of awkward questions afterwards. Thanks. OK, so we're open for questions. <clears throat> Just a question for the panel, I don't know who's best to answer it. Um, we've been talking a lot about partnerships today and what are your feelings upon bringing in a, an investor or investment group into the partnerships like the Innovation Portal in order to help the um, commercialisation of technology and make it succeed and help, help lower that risk? Um. Perfectly open to uh, any prospective investment uh, from whatever source, to, to be fair. Uh, it has to be um, consistent uh, with the, the SME that we're dealing with and as well as ourselves. Um, so it really is about aligning all the interests and all the, all the parties there. So uh, in terms of leveraging you know, uh, the IP and the funding that is there, if there's some investment coming into the pot as well, then fine. Clearly, you know, the title to IP needs to accrue um, uh, to, to whoever in, in that collaboration. But uh, if it's ring-fenced, um, then um, perfectly feasible that that should happen. But then that's a, 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 probably a, another stakeholder that needs to be um, addressed, and funding will come with its terms and conditions that have to be acceptable to, to, to all parties and, and not least the business uh, concerned as well. So but if there's room for an investor, uh, why not? But I think so. some people, some places do that sort of thing in, in a specific model. If you look at a, a Ipso Ventures or IP group, what they tend to do is they invest along with the university, but they want basically a blanket coverage. They want to own all the IP that comes out of a medical, a medical institute, and they'll basically be the ones that fund. So they basically almost take over the IP, the uh, intellectual property group the university's activities from that institute or that group. And I know that you know, Ipso Ventures owns uh, Manchester, Southampton, and I think Bristol University Medical School's IP rights. 
Um, I know there's at least one group talking to uh, a couple of Scottish universities about doing this as well. So it does happen, but it's pretty much, you give away a lot of ownership in terms of they pick and choose what they want out of your technology. So it's a useful source of funds, but it's a double-edged sword. I think getting early stage investment is, is pretty much the hardest thing to do. Um, you need somebody who is willing to invest in quite a few companies because the risk is very, very high as has been discussed. And you need a company that's going to be willing to put money into five or 10 or 15 companies because then they can focus on the winners and they don't have to be too concerned about the ones which are, you know, the high percentage, which ultimately is not going to be worth as much as the money that was put in. And that means you need someone um, who's reasonably patient with a reasonable amount of money, but you also need a, a cluster of institutions that is going to generate enough ideas to generate that number of companies as well. Um, I mean, arguably, you would think that Dundee's track record in biomedical sciences, this is the sort of place where that could happen. So for the bio portal, what do you think, I mean, you're only just getting going, but your license income relative to your patent costs, what do you think that ratio is going to be in two or three years' time? Do you think you're going to get your money back, or are you... Uh, I mean, I couldn't tell you specifics, but no, that's not uh, an expectation of, of this kind of relationship. I mean, it's really leveraging the IP uh, that we have got. Um, making money's nice and fine if we can do it, but it's not top of our list and, and engaging here. It's really just trying to open up what we've got, uh, make it what we've got accessible to, to SMEs that they can take it on and develop it further. Um, and what we will do is we'll share in any benefit uh, downstream. So, um, you know, we're not actually doing this in terms of uh, numbers, uh, financial return. Question. You've got your colleagues down the road in Glasgow who are talking about easy access, but to them that means giving it away and all you have to do is to show as a company that you're going to exploit within three years and you have to acknowledge the university and if there's potential for collaboration, consultancy, or whatever. The really interesting thing about that, um, looking at the figures recently for the Brussels Group of Universities, if you take out Oxbridge, Imperial, and LSE, if you have a look at the, the 15 that are left, Glasgow, um, per uh, million spent on research in terms of licensing income, back come bottom of that league. But if you have a look at the consultancy and contract research, they come out top of the league. Well, there's a lesson there. So. You know, sometimes it's better to take the money now and collaborate and get that intellectual. And we want, you know, frankly, we want biotechs to survive because we want them to run quickly, we want a license from them, or we want to buy them. I mean, and the, and the whole business models are changing now. Uh, I think with the, the REF impact agenda and academics thinking more now about the impact of what they're doing, they're going to want to engage more than, than ever before. Um, but people shouldn't just think in terms of massive license revenues coming in. They should think about being truly collaborative and what they can get to drive the business. Even VCs are approaching us now because they want to de-risk their funds. They want us to sit in and perhaps even put into, into some of these funds so that we de-risk for them. So we're all having to share. You know, I would concur with that sentiment. I mean, what's happening in Glasgow there, they've, they've, they've announced a, a free IP model and that's fine uh, for them if it works for them and, and their institution um, and if they see priorities in, in, in certain areas, consultancy, uh, contract research or whatever. Uh, in our respect here, um, you know, we're, we're basically opening up our IP portfolios. Uh, we're not giving it away, but we're making it accessible um, and so that in a joint collaborative mode, uh, we can deliver some results and returns um, and that there'll be something in it for everybody. So it's, you know, it's consistent um, uh, in terms of it's not an open innovation uh, type uh, model, but it is a new business model uh, where we, we do see some value in IP um, now and in the future uh, as well. well. That's not um, everything. They're not doing absolutely everything. No. I think that's also part of the macro environment as well though, I mean, nobody is going to be able to do the Harvard model just now, you know, if you can't take companies out to the public market, you can't actually get your money, your money back out of them, then you can't recycle it and do it again. So if you're running an academic group or a university department, 
and you basically look at your budget for the next two years and say we've got a 20% shortfall, then you have to go down that model. You have to fund. Uh, maybe in, in the dim fantasy future, 10 years' time, when biotech's back in fashion, etc., you can go back to being more aggressive Harvard model royalty on, in, or, or royalty on income and value, but just now it's not going to happen. Just to add to um, John's and to Malcolm's comments, I think if we looked at the Glasgow model, we would actually developed the Bioportal model before that. Um, Glasgow, as you say, it, it's for a section of their IP. It's not actually the whole portfolio, uh, potentially for Dundee. It's the whole portfolio, but it's got to match what the SME demand is. So we're, we're not talking about IP that's really had its day perhaps, or perhaps it's had a few failures, we're talking about if we can find the match, we will go out and we'll, we'll break the barriers by actually not looking for any upfronts or early milestones or anything. So we really are talking about sharing in the future. So I, I think we are doing what, um, what you're talking about in, in a different way. And, and I think um, if you give out free IP, I think that, that's also a good thing to do. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that we would never do that either but we're unlikely to do it with the, the whole portfolio and, and it's easier to sort of work with your, you know, your third party uh, sponsors like Wellcome Trust and charities where you do have some obligations as well. So we're just, we're very flexible, you know that Malcolm, in terms of we'll, we'll look at all sorts of models. We set out with government funding but to watch out for state aid as well. So um, there has to be a return further down, but we're talking about further out. We, we generally want collaboration if we can then go on and do a TSB or anything like that, any collaborative funds, that's what we're looking for. So I, I think we're, we're doing what you know, Kevin is doing in a different way, really. Hi, I'll just start with a shameless plug. Um, I'm Angela Collier from Scottish Enterprise. I forgot. <laughs> I, sorry, I, I forgot. <laughs> I was just going to, to add to amongst uh, Will's many years of experience and many different hats that he wears. He's also a member of Global Scott. And if any of you would like to find out what the enigmatic Global Scott is and how it can help any of you today, I'll be at the dinner and I'll be around tomorrow for one-to-one -one meetings. So please do find me and come and say hello. Now that I finish I'm, with this, I'm there as well, sir. Exactly. And Will is here, and you know, between the two of us, uh, do grab either of us for a talk. My actual question about the talk today was for the investments. Are investments decreasing because VCs are just sticking to existing portfolios, or are they still looking up? It's just they're being much, much more selective now. Part of it is that uh, a lot of portfolios are coming to an end, and the VC model is you're successful with fund one, and you go out and raise more money for fund two, et cetera, et cetera. Because there's been no way out for them, they're now sitting on fund two with no exits from it. And fund one was 10 years ago, so nobody's going to benchmark against that, which means that they're trying to go out and raise fund three without having realised any gains, which means that the fund three, instead of being 50% higher than the fund, previous fund, is quite often 30 or 40% lower. And then they're looking at the existing portfolio on fund two and saying, this, we plan to be cash generative after year six or seven. We're now at year 11. We can't do that anymore. That means in the new fund, instead of having a 30% provision for follow-ons, we're going to up that provision to 50%, which means that they're holding a lot more cash back, uh, basically because they need it to keep their existing portfolios going. So part of it is the fund size is smaller now, which means they've got less money to play with. And the other thing is the provision, the reserve they're holding back, has more than doubled, which again means the actual, actual active capital at work is substantially decreased. I'm conscious of the uh, timing. <laughs> uh, just a very quick question. Um, uh, recently, we've been uh, a couple of meetings in Europe, and one of the things we've been talking about is the strength of the angel investment community in Scotland. You know, that has been there uh, de facto acting as a bank uh, for, for a lot of companies. I was just wondering about the, the feeling on syndicated angel investment, whether there's a potential there for getting larger sums of money uh, and de-risking uh, by uh, sharing knowledge across Europe in particular, uh, whether the, fee uh, the feeling is that that could be a mechanism for funding of, of biotech especially. 
I think one of the reasons why the angel model in Scotland is so influential, um, I'm not using successful, that's not a criticism of them, I just think it's the way the world is, you've not actually managed to necessarily generate huge amounts of returns back, it doesn't mean your investments are bad, I think it can still come. But one of the reasons why the angel's investment is so strong is that you don't have a local later stage VC, so you're having to plug a big, much bigger gap in Scotland than you would have to if you go down to England, you go to the Golden Triangle, Oxford, Cambridge, London, there's some VC, uh, some angels there, not huge amounts. Go across Europe, very, very few actual angel groups. Lots of uh, high net worth individuals that perform the act of an angel, but quite often acting by themselves. So I think that uh, it's, while I, I really like what the angels are doing in Scotland, it's actually a symptom of the problem that they're having to do it. Uh, and so I'm not sure putting angel syndicates together is the right idea. Unfortunately, angels don't really have a quality mark when it comes to speaking to large VCs. So having a group of angels in place, they don't really have anything to benchmark that with. So they'll go in and treat the investment completely cold. I've spoken to LSPs, Sofa Nova, uh, almost all the VC funds across Europe, including Abingworth, etc., in England. And they basically say, we'd love to invest in Scotland, but we only co-invest alongside a strong local partner which would be what they consider to be a peer, a VC peer. Unfortunately, uh, and I think they're wrong, but unfortunately they don't see angel syndicates as being that. I'd like to ask Will who he thinks is responsible for the dark place we're in at the moment. Is it Big Pharma, the VCs themselves, or is it management for not killing off bad pro uh, companies early enough? And what do you think we have to do to get back to a bright place where we uh, can all raise money when we need it? Well, it's not because in my next fundraising I'll probably go and ask people like GSK to give me money. That'll say that they're not really to blame. I, th I think that their strategy is perfectly in line with what you'd expect a company to do in the current situation. Is you don't take on even more, more risky projects when your internal pipeline is showing that you, know, you may not have the skills to do it. You'll de-risk it uh, as much as possible. I, I, I think the, the problem is actually the outside world, and it is the uh, generalists. The VCs are very slow. They're like tanks, you know, they're like super tankers. They're difficult to turn around because their funds are 10 years to 12 years old in terms of their length, which means a lot of the funds that are out there are six or seven years old, which means they wrote their investment policy, which they sold to their LPs in a different climate. And so they are still saying, we'll fund the end of phase two and somebody will come in and rescue us at that point. Uh, so they are partly to blame because they haven't changed their model fast enough, but it's hard, hard to do. I think the biggest problem is actually, as I say, the general financial markets that you cannot exit. And if you can't exit, you can't recycle money. Simple as that. It's no point in having a paper valuation that goes through the roof if you can't actually take that and use it for something else. And I, I put a lot of the blame on, for example, pension funds. I think in Europe they put far too little. If you consider the size of the pension fund pot in Europe, it's you know hundreds of mil, hundreds of billions. If they would just free one or two percent higher for investing in risk, then suddenly you've got a large, large pool of money. That's, that pops out. Uh, that's what you don't have here. You do have in the US. Look at most of the large VCs in, in the US. A lot of their core investors are the state of California pension fund because they, that's worth billions and they can put 10% of that into risk. Here, the bit large generalist funds won't put any money into risk and that's the problem. So they're the, they're the nasty people. <laughs> Okay, if there's any more questions, I guess we can take them over coffee. Um, so I believe, looking at the screen in front of me, we're reconvening in 11 minutes. <laughs>